In November 1918, just before the armistice, Republicans won control of both the House and Senate. Thus, any treaty negotiated by Wilson would have to gain substantial Republican backing in the Senate to be ratified by the two-thirds vote. To reach this number, Wilson had to seek at least tacit support from Republican Henry Cabot Lodge, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Lodge held Wilson in contempt, a sentiment the president reciprocated. Lodge, like Wilson, had a career as an academic author of historical and political treatises, but considered Wilson a sanctimonious idealist and second-rate scholar. Rather than reaching out to Lodge and other rivals, Wilson refused to name any prominent Republicans or any senators at all to the peace delegation that he led personally to Europe in December 1918. Before going to Paris, Wilson visited London and Rome, where Dorian crowds responded to his calls for negotiating a people's peace. Italian newspapers praised him as the king of humanity, while British writer and social reformer H.G. Wells called him a political messiah. Thirty-two nations, not including Germany or communist Russia, attended the peace conference in Paris between January 18th and June 28, 1919. Despite Wilson's promise to negotiate via open diplomacy, American, British, French, Italian, and Japanese delegates did most of the important work behind closed doors, isolated from public scrutiny and with little input from other nations. They concentrated on forging a new map of Europe and dividing the colonial territories of the defeated powers. But to their surprise and irritation, stateless and colonial peoples including Armenians, Africans, Jews, Arabs, Chinese, Koreans, Indians, and Egyptians tried hard to influence the outcome. During the months-long deliberation in Paris, British Prime Minister Lloyd George, French Premier Georges Clemenceau, and Italian leader Vittorio Orlando concentrated on carving out spheres of interest in Europe and the Middle East. Orlando who cared mostly about annexing Austrian territory near the Alps and along the Adriatic coast, left Paris in a huff when he felt that not enough land had been ceded. Lloyd George and Clemenceau insisted on weakening Germany by imposing strict limits on future German armaments, having France occupy some German territory along its border, and imposing a huge reparations bill designed to make Germany pay for wartime destruction. The British and French also insisted that Germany accept as part of the peace treaty a war guilt clause in which it assumed sole responsibility for the Great War. Wilson, who spent months in Paris and sensed that domestic support for his policies was eroding, had a difficult time resisting these harsh demands. Even though the tone and substance of many decisions made at the conference violated the spirit of his 14 points, Wilson focused his energy on drafting plans for a League of Nations. Since he needed British and French support for this, he hesitated to break with them. Even as he waffled on some principles, Wilson pushed for policies desired by American progressives. For example, he fought successfully to create an International Labor Organization, or ILO, as a League of Nations agency to oversee and coordinate labor policies among member states. Although the president privately acknowledged that the peace treaty drafted in Paris was far from ideal, he believed that once the League began to function, it could modify these imperfect territorial, economic, and political shortcomings. Above all, Wilson insisted that future peace and prosperity required the U.S. and the world's major powers to accept Article 10 of the proposed League's covenant, or charter. This established a system of, quote, collective security, that pledged all League members to safeguard the territory and independence of all other members. This system, Wilson argued, would deter future aggression or quickly punish any transgressors. But Wilson had another reason for accommodating wartime allies, like the British, French, and Japanese. He feared the spread of revolution from Russia and wanted quick, cooperative action to stifle the Bolshevik regime. In mid-1918, following Vladimir Lenin's peace deal with Germany that took Russia out of the war, the U.S. and Allies had sent troops to northern Russia, ostensibly to keep war supplies stored there out of German hands. But in fact, the foreign armies assisted the Whites, as the anti-communists were known, in what became a brutal three-year civil war with the Bolsheviks. 
Wilson sent additional troops to Siberia, where they joined Japanese and European forces in a vain effort to hold the vast region against the communists. Around the time of Germany's surrender in November 1918, communist groups inspired by the Bolsheviks briefly seized power in Berlin and other German cities, and in Hungary. To counter this threat to Central and Eastern Europe, the Allies provided support to local anti-communist forces who quickly regained power. The concern with halting the spread of communism from Russia contributed to the decision at Paris to create a buffer of anti-communist states, such as Finland, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, out of what had been the western fringe of Tsarist Russia. The victors completed drafting the peace treaty in June, nearly eight months after the armistice, and presented it to Germany on a non-negotiable basis. On June 28, 1919, with its ports still blockaded, with its economy in ruins, and amid threats of uprisings by left-wing revolutionaries and right-wing militarists, the German government accepted the harsh terms. At a signing ceremony at the old imperial palace outside Paris, Wilson described the treaty, despite his own misgivings, as reflecting, quote, the hand of God. The political and economic climate in the U.S. had changed dramatically by the time the peace treaty came back to Washington for Senate ratification in the summer of 1919. The cancellation of most war contracts triggered a sharp recession. Economic uncertainty coincided with a growing fear of Bolshevism abroad and at home, especially a belief that communist agents, referred to as Reds, either caused or planned to take advantage of labor unrest to seize power. During 1919, major employers cut workers' wages and hours, prompting a nationwide wave of labor unrest. Although the communist movement inside the U.S. was tiny, it was often portrayed as the tip of a Bolshevik lance and held responsible for strikes and acts of violence. In January 1919, unions in Seattle called a general strike that briefly shut down the city. During May and June, several prominent government officials and financiers received bombs in the mail, apparently sent by an anarchist group. Several exploded, killing innocent bystanders rather than their intended targets. These, along with later bombings, convinced many Americans that labor activists and communists were little more than terrorists. In the fall, Boston police officers went on strike, prompting Massachusetts Governor Calvin Coolidge to send in the National Guard as replacements. Coolidge became a national celebrity by declaring, quote, There is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, anytime, end quote. In September, more than 300,000 steel workers walked out when the big mills tried to restore the 12-hour day, 7-day work week, and reduced wages. Industry executives denounced the strikers as revolutionaries and hired many replacement workers, including 30,000 African Americans as strike breakers. The walkout collapsed in January 1920. Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer declared that these events taken together revealed a, quote, blaze of revolution that had engulfed the nation. By dousing the flames, he hoped to win the Democratic presidential nomination in November 1920 and to succeed Wilson. Palmer appointed a young protege, J. Edgar Hoover, to lead the intelligence division within the Justice Department to track radicals. In 1919, Hoover compiled lists of thousands of suspected suspects, many of them immigrants who belonged to groups like the IWW and newly organized Communist Party. In December, about 250 of these non-citizens were seized and deported to communist-ruled Russia. In January 1920, the Attorney General authorized a broader sweep. The so-called Palmer raids occurred in 33 cities where federal agents without warrants broke into homes and meeting halls to arrest more than 4,000 people on charges of subversion. About 600 people who were seized were deported. Although President Wilson tacitly approved Palmer's harsh methods, the Attorney General overreached. In the spring of 1920, he claimed to have uncovered a, quote, red plot to seize national power on May 1st and deployed troops to protect government buildings and officials. When the day passed peacefully and Palmer could not show evidence that such a plot had actually existed, his credibility and presidential hopes dissolved. However, his young assistant, Hoover, survived the episode. 
an exceptionally skilled bureaucratic infighter Hoover stayed on after the Republican sweep in 1920 and in 1924 became director of the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, later renamed the FBI, a job he held for nearly 50 years. Ironically, an actual terror attack, about which he knew nothing, took place after Palmer's disgrace. On September 16, 1920, an anarchist group exploded a large bomb in front of the offices of J.P. Morgan Company on Wall Street in New York City. The explosion, the deadliest terror incident on American soil until the Oklahoma City bombings of 1995, killed 38 people and wounded 400 others. Like earlier attacks, the victims were mostly working people and not powerful bankers. Instead of promoting revolution, the attack frightened ordinary Americans and contributed to a more conservative drift in national politics. Even before Wilson formally submitted the Versailles Treaty for ratification, 39 senators, more than the one-third needed to defeat it, signed a petition demanding that the League of Nations recognize that the Monroe Doctrine gave the U.S. preeminence in the Western Hemisphere. When the treaty reached the Senate in the summer of 1919, Senator Lodge bitterly criticized it. He argued that Article 10 of the League Covenant, the basis for collective security, unfairly restricted America's freedom of action and might oblige the country to engage in unwise military ventures without congressional approval. During extended public hearings, Lodge introduced many revisions of the text designed to protect Congress's power to make war and to control domestic issues with international ramifications such as immigration, tariffs, and so forth. Other conservative opponents ridiculed the idea that someday an African, Chinese, or Indian representative to the League might sit as an equal to a U.S. delegate. To Wilson's surprise, many progressives voiced doubts about the treaty and League. Senator William Burra, an Idaho Republican, worried that if the U.S. joined the League, it would have to defend British and French colonies or join the Europeans in an anti-communist crusade. Other liberals complained that Wilson had deserted his own principles by imposing a harsh peace on Germany, by allowing Japan to control parts of China, and by ignoring his pledge to spread democracy. Imposing harsh penalties on Germany, they warned, would fuel a desire for revenge, a prediction partly confirmed by Hitler's later rise to power. A few senators criticized the treaty because of some of their constituents objected to specific, often minor, territorial adjustments that had moved a village where their grandparents had been born from, for example, Hungary to Czechoslovakia, and they wanted the boundary restored. Wilson dismissed nearly all these criticisms by saying that he had been compelled to make compromises to assure British and French support for the League of Nations. Most of the problems that senators identified could be solved after the treaty had been ratified and once the League of Nations, with the U.S. as a member, began its work. The president opposed any revisions by the Senate because it would open the door to endless changes by other signatories. Wilson began a cross-country speaking tour in September 1919 to bolster popular support for Senate approval of the treaty without changes. He delivered three dozen speeches in three weeks, often to large and enthusiastic crowds. To reject the treaty and league, he warned, would bring on a new war and, quote, the very existence of civilization would be in the balance, end quote. On September 26th, at the end of a speech in Pueblo, Colorado, Wilson collapsed. Four days later, he suffered a nearly fatal stroke that paralyzed his left side. For several months, First Lady Edith Wilson hid the gravity of her husband's condition and acted as his surrogate. After partially recovering, Wilson became even more stubborn. He rejected any compromise with his opponents or supporters. He even insisted that Senate Democrats prove their loyalty by voting against an amended treaty, even if they agreed with the changes. As a result, three times between November 1919 and March 1920, the Senate voted down the treaty with and without amendments. Had Wilson allowed Senate Democrats to vote in favor of the amended treaty, it would have likely passed. To end the state of war with Germany and its allies, Congress eventually passed a simple resolution. The rejection of the Versailles Treaty and League membership signified a deep division among American leaders. Some, 
Like Wilson, believed the Great War proved the U.S. must join formally with other nations in managing world trade and enforcing peace. Critics of the League argued that membership would needlessly entangle the U.S. in European conflicts and restrict Americans' freedom to act. Both sides of the debate actually agreed that the nation had global interests and could not isolate itself from world affairs, but they disagreed strongly over how the U.S. should exercise its power and defend its interests collectively through the League of Nations or unilaterally by picking and choosing issues and nations with whom it would cooperate. I'm so sad to think that I have had to turn you from your home so fully. I'd be gaining nothing by remaining for what would Mrs. Grundy say. Her convention kindly recollect to them, we must please respect to them duly. I felt my courage winning. Please, I beg your mention it. I should not find a bit, but it has started raining. Oh, the, the rain, rain from the pits of Sabbath. And I know you'll be safe in a bed. Guys are weeping. And to 